to. Did you know that every employee was excited to go to work at one point? Every single one of them ran to work excited at one point, even if it was the night before on the, online looking at the values before the interview. They were focused, they were enthusiastic, right? If we're all motivated all of the time, then why can it be so difficult to motivate others and ourselves sometimes? Right. The greatest dilemma ever, it was unintentional, it was well-meaning, but we've been misled by a predominant behaviorist approach on understanding and engaging and motivating people. Think about it for a second. How many people have taken a course on how to understand people's behavior at some point in their life? Whether it was counseling or management, right? Working with the difficult person. Well, maybe that difficult person is having difficulty because they're working for you. Have you ever thought about that for a second? <laughs> maybe their antisocial personality just happens to happen at four, you know, between eight and four. Because <laughs> everybody else you meet, they don't know him this way. Do you see what I'm getting at? We've been, for most of us, we've been taught to gather information about specific behaviors in order to do what? To do two things. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at myself. I was, I was a professor, right? I taught people to interpret behavior, right? To interpret it. For what? For what purpose? To manage it. We don't even need their involvement, actually. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We don't need them, OK? So it's just a perspective. I want you to think about this for a second. How do you know what you know about somebody's behavior if they're not talking to you? Where do you go? To a book? To HR? To a course? I was asked to consult on a difficult case, whether it was a teenager, whether it was a corporate leader, whether it was someone who's getting ready to be ushered out because they're on a performance management Interesting plan. Interesting thing, a lot of times we're consulting, none of these people are there. So that's an empty interrogation chair. 90% of, of the time, think about this, 90% of the time we're sitting in a room talking about Joe, who they've been struggling with for three years but the union won't let him go. We got three HR people. We got the last two directors he's worked with. He's not in the room though. He hasn't been in the room for about nine months. So think about this for a second. What are we doing? We're interpreting his behavior. How? Well, we're taught to gather information. We're taught, we're not taught to make meaning. There's a big difference. Where do we get our information and how do we get it? Well, we start maybe with the file information, the personnel file, or maybe it's an actual file, right? It's got all the social history, all the times he did this, all the times she did that, what, you know, where they were, what they've done. It's, it's, there's lots of information in there. There's lots of labels in there, too. They're not just bad. Labels aren't bad. Like, funny is a label. Oh, yeah, I can see if he's funny. <laughs> I wish they would have said smart, but I'll take funny, right? But there's also other labels like for the unmotivated, like apathetic, lazy, right? uninterested, aggressive, violent, right? manipulative. He really needed this job, Steve. Yeah, he, really, he was desperate. So there's a label right? with a generalization. Right? Just read the file. <laughs> oh, here we go. It's getting thick. It's getting thick. Experts. Who's an expert? Anybody that has an opinion on this person. Just some people are more expert than others, right? right? So if you have a degree, right? Human behavior theories, that's huge. How many people have read a human behavior theory on attachment or object relations theory or psychodynamic or systems or structural or you name it, just all existential, right? Narrative. There's a theory on everything. What's his problem? Well, I think he's the first sibling in his, in his family. So he's got to be the leader. I think that's what's going on. He's got trouble with authority. No, OK, no. I think he has attachment issues. What? Well, he's from Poland. How old is he, right? Have you heard this, right? This is, what, this is what we do. We make tons of assumptions. We make tons of assumptions. But the thing about assumptions is that we don't think we're making them. Because you hear people, they say, I swear. Have you heard that? I swear. I swear he's not coming into work. I swear it. OK. How do you know? And then around and around they go. We have our story. Our story gets in the way all the time. That's when, oh, when I was, when I was, when I was. When my kids were, I wouldn't. I, newsflash, they're not you. I'm just saying, just as a starting point. Right? Well, if I was him, I would. He's not you either. We can't, we can't do this, right? How about medication? <laughs> have you heard this one come in? I think, it's, I think it's his medication. This happens all the time. Once we get a piece of information, it changes the way we see things. Does that make sense? Where do we get our information? 
How about theories of performance management? I used to teach some of this stuff. Some of my colleagues are here, right? We used to bring people into a room and talk about the undesirable employee who was back at the office working. They had no idea we were spending three days talking about them in a vacuum, right? <laughs> we had like all 27 theories on the wall. Like, pick one. Where does he fit? Where does he fit? Now develop a plan. And we were wondering, why is this not working? <laughs> 20 years of doing this, right? Somebody could get up right now and leave the room. Don't do it. Don't do it. But if you do, we're going to be talking about you. Someone at your table is going to go, you know, I knew, I knew he was going to leave. That's how it's going to start. Sit there, I'm just, I knew. He's, do you know him? No, I don't. He has that bit of a twitch, doesn't he? Yeah, I think he's on medication. <laughs> Where does he work? I think he works for the city. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Seriously? For how long? Well, he's not been married, you know, ever since that drinking thing. Oh, my God. And around <laughs> this person, when they come back to the table, has changed, right? He looks the same, but has changed. How often does this happen, do you think? This happens under positive circumstances. When we add stress, right, when we add tension, it intensifies, right? Because when we're stressed and frustrated, we look for answers to try to make us feel better, to get some sort of control over the situation. And I've heard so often people going, I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, let's just finish it. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> That's the conclusion. I don't know what we're going to do. Let's just end it. Let's just get rid of them. <laughs> I just want the suffering to stop. But what you don't know is the suffering is going to stop here, but it's going to continue for that person and for everybody else here in a very different way. But we get that moment of relief, right? What was interesting is we were missing important meaning. We had lots of information. We had so much information, but see, this is the problem. The information becomes the problem. We were asking, we were taught to ask, what do we know about this? I did it as a professor for years. I taught people to look at behavior and interpret. The question was, what do we know about this? What do we know about Joe leaving the table in the middle of? That's the question that we asked, and that's where we stopped, but it was the wrong question. We should have been asking, what do we know about this from this person's perspective? That's the question we should have been asking. Because it's impossible to answer without them in that chair, without them in that room. It's impossible to answer, because what do we know about this from this person's perspective? Nothing. The interesting thing about this, this was hard for me. I was a professor of human behavior. I was, I was supposed to have the answers. I would come to a room with psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers. I'd go to companies where they had HR and everybody. What's going on, Steve? You know what I'm saying? Give me the information, <laughs> right? In would come the files. I'd listen to the stories. That person was never there. Not only do we not get the time back, but we actually move farther away from what the real issue is. So, the source of many of our problems, the stress, the conflict, is not due to miscommunication. The conflict exists due to a misunderstanding of meaning. meaning and I then. use that word. Meaning is based on an accurate understanding of the person's experience as it relates to four things. Needs, values, goals, and strengths. Misunderstanding is the result of missing the meaning or value a particular situation holds for those involved. So this is the question that I want you to imprint on your executive functioning, the prefrontal part of your cortex that fires all the time. First thing, whenever you see something that you're concerned about, ask yourself immediately, what do I know about this? And the this is whatever you're concerned about. The leaving the table, the not getting out of bed, the saying two things and meaning one thing. Whatever you're concerned about becomes the this in that question. What do I know about him saying he was going to be at the training and he's not there from his perspective. Nothing. See how that works? Because what I used to do was I'd get fired up with that and fired up with something else. And I was no longer present where I needed to be present. And the interesting thing is 90% of the stuff I was upset about was fictitious. But I didn't believe it was fictitious. I believed it to be true, which determined how I felt about it, which determined how I act, which usually made it worse. But sometimes we don't know things are worse yet until it takes us out at the knees when we're least expecting it, right? Have you ever gotten a piece of information on a situation you're struggling with and a whole bunch of things made sense after that? Like you look back at a situation and went, oh, right? right? You didn't just get a piece of information, you got a piece of meaning. And it made other things make sense. If you use this question every single day when you're concerned about something, it will transform the way you see things. Meetings with difficult situations are now taking under 20 minutes to get to things we've missed for 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 15 years.
So in your mind right now, I want you to do this test. Consider a specific person and a behavior of theirs that you're concerned about. Most of us have someone in our life. Maybe it's an employee. Maybe it's a family member. What do you know about whatever that behavior is from their perspective? Now, your brain's going to want to say things, well, it's because of people or because she or I had a cousin or an employee. I've seen this before, Steve. All of that is irrelevant. What would they say are their needs, their values, their goals around that situation? I've done this with over 1,000 people in the last year. Most of us come up with... I don't know. You have an option to use information to be the basis for your reactions, or you can start by making meaning and asking yourself, what do I really know about this from this person's perspective? And you will start to optimize your potential, and you will start to minimize and sometimes eliminate the unnecessary suffering that you have in your life.